This is a production of Cornell University. Thank <laughs> you. 
Welcome, everyone, to the spring semester's In a Word conversation. I thank the Z Zelazniks for their support of this event and invite you all to attend the reception in the English Lounge. Lyra Van Cleef Stefanen is the author of Open Interval, National Book Award finalist, and Black Swan, winner of the 2001 Cave Canem Poetry Prize, as well as Poems in Conversation and a Conversation, a chapbook in collaboration with Elizabeth Alexander. Her work has appeared in such journals as African American Review, Kalalu, Crab Orchard Review, Gulf Coast, and in the anthologies Bum Rush the Page, Roll Call, Commonwealth, Gathering Ground, and The Ringing Ear, Black Poets Lean South. She is currently at work on a third collection entitled The Coal Tar Colors. As a scholar of African American literature and culture, Dagmari Bumshet works at two pivotal intersections between African American and sexuality studies and between African American and African studies. These overlapping areas of inquiry inform his scholarship and research, including his book, The Calendar of Loss, Race, Sexuality, and Mourning in the Early Era of AIDS, Johns Hopkins University Press. Wimshed is the co-editor of Ethiopia Literature, Art, and Culture, a special issue of Kalalu. His work has also appeared in Transition, Inca, Journal of Contemporary African Art, Art South Africa, and Africa Lives, an anthology of memoirs and autobiographies. He is currently working on two new book projects, Here Be Saints, James Baldwin's Late Style, and New Flower, a memoir. In 2010, he was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. In 2014, he was named one of the 10 best professors at Cornell. Let me now do the warm up for the act of love and translation you are about to witness. Dagmari Wumshed and Lai Ray Van Cleef Stefanen, you are my magnitude and bond. Gwendolyn Brooks writes in the poem Paul Robeson, we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, we are each other's magnitude and bond. Professor Wumshed has given us these very words, the poetics of compounding loss in his space-making book, The Calendar of Loss. I want to lean into the poetics of compounding love as I introduce this scene of translation and love that is about to happen. Gwendolyn Brooks says, we are the last of the loud. The loud in Lyrae's poems is the last of the quiet. We woke up like this, just as loud as we are quiet. This compounding love sounds like Lyrae's hand flutter as she makes words slow down, as if she is teaching us how to sound this whirlwind out. By choice and desire, Dag, we are black and this love compounded. Thank you for sounding out all that choice and all that desire. Lyrae, this black woman's work really is an interval that we might call open. I say we need new grammar. Lyra, you say we need new punctuation. This love has always been such a lush practice of translation. Dag, who says lush in the lush way you say it? Love compounded might be love unsounded until Dagmawi and Lyra meet in the compounding and just start sounding and sounding. As Lyra writes in her poem, Migration, go with your ratchet, go with what moves you. Please join me in applauding Dagmari Wumshet and Lyra Van Cleef Stefanen. <laughs> let me also say, <laughs> let me also say, this is Dag's last lecture at Cornell. We might disappoint you after that introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Margot Natalie. I wrote a poem for Margot Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we, we're going to start with a reading, some translation, and then have a conversation. 
You want to start with Axum? Yes. Do you want to, do you want to talk about it or just read? Uh, yeah, let's set it up for them. Okay. So in 2010, um, we took a trip with um, Callaloo, the, the literary journal Callaloo, to Addis Ababa um, and to Lalibela and to Axum in Ethiopia. You want to tell us about um, Axum? Axum? Axum is the uh, ancient Ethiopian city. Uh, it's where uh, Christianity took root in the fourth century. And it is one of the uh, uh, oldest uh, cities in the world uh, at its height. That's where the, uh, uh, all the commerce of the Red Sea uh, it was the hub of empire, and it is where Ethiopian civilization found uh, root. Um, and Lalibela is a, a medieval uh, 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 city. Um, and so after we spent time in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, we traveled north to these uh, ancient cities. And we both had uh, an extraordinary experience, especially in Lalibela that uh, uh, un not just underscored, affirmed and sealed our friendship uh, in one of the, the most beautiful architecture. Uh, one of the seven wonders. Seven wonders the, in the, the world. Bet Georgi's church, St. George's church, was one of the rock, is one of the rock hewn um, churches hewn out of the side of a mountain. And it's one of the seven wonders of the world. And yes, we were visiting. <laughs> And we received uh, just us. We happened to go back to the church after we did a, a tour with a group, the two of us, and we found uh, the priest of that church. And he gave us a blessing. Just out of, out of the clear blue sky, we were just together. And we went back to the, to the church. And the priest was there at the church. And he had uh, a bag of dirt from the church, from the sanctuary that he wanted to give to us. And he just started in, Har in, in Amharic giving us this blessing. And he's counting on the fingers of the, the, the knuckles of his fingers, all of the ways in which our friendship would be blessed and we would be blessed in knowing each other and all of this, just uh, counting it for us. It was just the strangest, most amazing thing to be there at this church and having this man say essentially like you're meant to know each other and these are all of the ways in which you're going to be blessed in this friendship. And finally put the dirt of the church in our mouth. Beneath and, uh, each of our tongues, yeah. So um, Aksum is uh, a poem uh, that's going to be in, 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 uh, in this collaboration. Uh, so that's the northern city. There are other poems on La Libela that would also make it. Uh, so, Aksum. Aksum. I imagine the dead cities beneath the teff. When fields give up their stones, the gift is mine. Stand one upright, construct a shed to protect ancient carved words from rain, and I will fly 8,000 miles to gawk at what I can't read. Children gather, offer up some coins, the fields tender. What do I know about a life of plowing? The donkeys keep their eyes down as I pass. Aksum. Yitayengal kat efusir resa katamochu. Maskochu dingayun siabarakatu sutotau yeneno. Akum katata ganaba matalea. Yet ent kertz kalatin kazanab lemetabak. An imimat adlo asrasus to she kilometer berre, Fazje lamate, Nibab in a sanyin. Lejo chuta sabasabu, Akarabu, Masku, Yafaraun, Santimoch. An imanak adlo, Seler Shanuro, 
ሳልፍ እንኳ አህዮቹ አይናቸውን ተቀደቁ ወደታች the idea for this project um oh well do we want to read the other poem and then yeah, talk about that sure. okay let's talk about that after okay so this second poem is called mercy and it's got two epigraphs one from gwendolyn brooks and one from the abstract painter julie moretto mercy art hurts art urges voyages and it is easier to stay at home gwendolyn brooks when it becomes inevitable when the painting is yearning when i cannot resist julie moretto beneath a silver sliver the beauty we walk through says dark unto itself brushes us with mean this simile smog gods a whisper on the shoulder tomorrow we will miss so line our eyes with meaning gorgeous the sound of prayers on canvas layered cartographies in english the x marked ha huh. an eyelash an explosion the very air smudged how sing it nde a rainstorm fermata firmament the seasons askings strung together habo and hallelujah mehrat sna tabab igodal sna tabab bahar madu guzon yadafafral qallallawna bet meqamat wendelin brooks yemayqar qataro sidars sulu fellagotun sisha ane ساستلين جولي مراتو ببر سنتقصر ترامدن يمن الفبت وبت چلماو يراسي نو يلال يبورشنال براسو فتشي تنصاصاري بكلاير يغزابهر شوكشوكتا نغه يمن نافقاو تكشالاي سلازي ايناچنن بترغوم اسمرو ውበት የጸሎቶቹ ድምጽ ሸራ ላይ የተነባበረ ካርታ ናቸው በእንግሊዘኛ የኤክስ ፊደል ምልክቱ ሃ ሽፉ ሽፍት ፍንዳታ አየሩ ራሱ የተፈገፈገ እንዴት ልስፈ ነው እንዴ ወጮፍ ዝናፍ ጋባለ የወቅቱ ጥያቄዎች አብረው ተሳሰሩ እንደ ሀብልና ሃለሉያ so so that the idea for this project came out of we were at another conference a kalalu conference in london and makoma's dad in gugi wationgo was there and he given this like really wonderful um talk and he asked the question in this talk what language do you want your work stored in and it just struck me while i was there at that conference that question i just couldn't stop thinking about that about that question and i knew immediately as soon as he as soon as he asked it that i wanted my work stored in an african language and when dagmali and i were talking about it the whole idea of your work stored in the language of your best friend was just took on kind of more and more and more life for me and it's like one of those things that we're kind of always thinking about and talking about between um the three of us amongst ourselves and amongst um our our students too the way that the life 
and the work are not supposed to be these separate things from each other, that the life is the work, that the major poem or the major work of art that you're creating really is your life, and that your work should grow out of that interior space and this notion of, I was thinking about it today because in this, in this book, in Dagmali's, in, um, in Dagmali's book, The Calendar of Loss, in the acknowledgments, you say, Lai Ray Van Cleef Stefanen is the reason why I, sent, why I call Ithaca home. And that I was thinking about in terms of language and where I want my poems held and where I want them to be, I want my poems to be in the language of my friend that I have. And it's an African language, but it's not like using the normal roots of like kind of how people would think about identity um, in terms of putting your poems into an African language. Um, it's, it's a choice that is based solidly out of friendship and out of the fact that the friendship and the and the academic work, literary work, whatever production that you're that you're making in your life, that that would be the space where you would want that that held. <laughs> uh, and 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 for me, very similar motivations of to the the chance to have the work of my best friend, uh, and also a poet I admire immensely and I treasure uh, the, the chance to translate that work and make it available to Amharic readers. Uh, the, the sense that somehow Amharic readers are bereft of your poetry <laughs> seemed, uh, 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 you know, uh, obscene. Uh, <laughs> so there was that excitement. Uh, and then I would say, uh, again, to, to come back to uh, Ngugi's uh, challenge imperative that he's issued to us all, and for, for, for many years now, many decades now, uh, of to translate works into an African language, that excitement, uh, uh, for me, in part, it's also to translate your work in a, in a script and in a language that predates English. Yes. Right? Uh, so the Ethiopian, you know, from Ge'ez into Amharic, that archive is, you know, close to two millennia old. And for a work like a contemporary writer uh, who writes in English uh, and a new world poet to have a home in the old world, I thought uh, that's also another way of, um, you know, shoring up, for instance, the connection between Africa and its diaspora. Um, the, the other excitement for me uh, also was we've had in, uh, you know, some, uh, some great poets in a European lingua franca who've come to Ethiopia and have written about Ethiopia. So uh, uh, Rambo lived in Ethiopia the latter years of his life and in fact married uh, uh, an Ethiopian woman. His work has been translated, his Ethiopia poems into Amharic. Uh, someone like Césaire, came to Addis uh, for the founding of the African uh, OAU, African Organization, Organization of African Unity. It's been re-Christian to the African Union now, in 1963, and wrote this extraordinary poem on Addis Ababa. And then it's been translated. So also it was to add to that repertoire of uh, poets, um, including you know, African diaspora poets who have written about Ethiopia and their work is now part of um, that archive. So uh, in addition to the friendship, the, uh, there was that uh, excitement and to return to my own native tongue through you, Lyre, you know, to discover new things about that language that was so formative for me growing up and remains formative. Uh, and that's been I think one of the great pleasures of this project is words that I have lived with that I didn't know were, uh, for instance, whisper mm -hmm. is a shukta. And I realize it's a, a, a right? And 
I've lived with this word. I mean, it's a simple word, whisper, right? Uh, but it was, I made that, that epiphany came in the process of translation. So I love what your poetry has afforded me to go back to this ancient tongue and begin to discover uh, all its, some of its resources, right? Yeah. I also wanted to point out, Axum is the place where, um, what do they call, Lu what is Lucy? A Dinkanesh. Dinkanesh yes. is um, the, the 3.2, how many years? 3.2 million year old, the old, where all of us come from, Axum is that place. And so that's the thing that I also like kind of wanted to be, to be thinking about um, with, the, with the poems, but also that um, dislocation at the same time as, as the location of this is, this is only my, my home via love, you know, by way, of, by way of love, I get access to this beautiful um, history. History, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let me ask you this, Ray. Um, when you look back at these poems, because so the, the second poem uh, uh, that I read is from uh, last summer in 2006. Um, uh, I, I spent la the last academic year in, in, in Addis Ababa, and I was curating a show by an Ethiopian American artist named uh, Julie Maratu, uh, preeminent abstract painter. Um, and we had a symposium, and for the symposium, uh, I asked, commissioned uh, a, a poet uh, who writes in Amharic, uh, 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 a great sculptor and poet, uh, and also Lyre, two poems inspired by Julie's paintings. So that, that the, uh, the second poem is a recent poem, uh, and in part, inspired by this painting. But I wonder, now that you, know, you, you first went to Ethiopia in 2010, and, but Ethiopia has been with you, we could say, since 2006, was, since we met in that close way. I wonder how your relationship, maybe through writing about it, has changed. Um, it's become, I'm more and more interested, so I'm, I'm planning to travel and, learn Amharic and, and have been trying to teach myself, which is <laughs> harder, <laughs> harder, and practicing with Dag and getting like um, pronuncia pronunciation help and all of that. But um, I'm in love with Ethiopia and this last trip, especially because it's in this state right now, Addis Ababa, the city is in this state of constant flux where there's just construction everywhere we went and you don't know what the city is going to look like six weeks from now much less six years from now is so interesting to me but then there were these like kind of strange parallels because of the hills like you know Ithaca with the seven hills and Addis with the hills and and I just fell in love with the city um more and more over the years but it has taken on this like kind of um spiritual um aspect to it which we were talking about on the way here you want to say the thing about agnosticism that we were talking about on on the yeah I, we, 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 on the way here i've um was saying that in terms of you know just anticipating this conversation and the way in which uh, our friendship has changed me. I think when we met 10 years ago, I was at best an agnostic. Uh, I mean, I grew up, a, you know, Orthodox Christian, uh, grew up in a household where my father was very Christian, not moralizing, but he, he you know, we have a, you've seen it, a, a prayer room in the house. And um, so I grew up, you know, in a strict Christian household. And over time, um, in fact, I could, if I could date two coordinates, it'd be uh, coming out and, or wrestling with my own sexuality and discovering the fire next time that gave me the, the chance to say, I could put it aside. Like, I don't have to be a prisoner of the tradition that I have inherited in that sense. Uh, but because Christianity is so formative of Ethiopian civilization, you cannot escape it. Uh, it's an 
it structures the calendar. It is in our very tongue. It's in the very greeting, even if you are a secular person. So even if, if I, when I considered my agnostic, it was still part of my tongue in that sense, right? And then I think v v via our friendship, I have returned to Christianity in a way that I can't even begin to explain to myself. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in a fundamentally changed way. Um, and that hadn't dawned on me until I was reflecting on this conversation and the way in which your friendship has fundamentally changed me. We were talking about um, the way in, in which in the book, there's uh, so much talk about the, the way that the secular and the sacred rub up against each other in the literature that you're, that you're thinking about and in, the, um, in mourning, in, in AIDS uh, loss that's in the book. But it really um, struck me when I was thinking about this conversation that um, the way that Ngugi's question like kind of forces you to like kind of think of your death next to your life in a way. And that like kind of seemed fitting to me to, for the way that we tend to interact with each other and live. We, are, we believe in living. <laughs> People who know us know we believe in living, living, like all of the life and all of the ways that we can get that. But the ways in which that as sacred became so much a part of a, of the way of, of thinking about making work and about making art, that that way of living, um, but also acknowledging, we have a tendency when we're together to, to talk about, you know, if it's tomorrow, yes. we had a good time, it was good. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> yes, like, that's fine. Like, I wanna live to a, to, you know, a ripe old age, but also if it's tomorrow, then that's okay because this living thing, you know, we've been fully engaged <laughs> with that, fully engaged. Well, let, let, let me skip there, Ray, because we were going to get to this, and we posted it on the, the description of, uh, you know, being serious about the sensual life. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> um, all its variations. <laughs> Or yes. iterations, right? Um, I've always loved the quote in, in The Fire Next Time where Baldwin says, you know, to be sensual is to be fully present in what one does, from the act of making love to the act of breaking bread, mm -hmm. right? And you can go on and think about even the uses of the erotic, where Audre Lorde talks about it as a well of that replenishes itself, and it is powerful, right? Uh, and I think just by temperament, but one thing that we've been vigilant about to, is to live the sensual life and to draw ethics from it, to draw a certain kind of, uh, even a political character from it. Uh, and let, so maybe we could, to concretize it, because I don't mm. want to trade in too much abstractions. Mm. So if we've had tongue many times, but three times. Uh, so if I said, describe, or if you want to talk about the central life first, yeah. tongue. Tongue. And I love how it, like, like, then it ties together with the translation and, and the work that we're trying to do, because it's there in language. When you think about tongue and you think about translation, it's there. But tongue, if Dag says tongue to me, the first thing I think about is Paris and being together in Paris and we had gone to a restaurant on a recommendation of someone and there was a chef in there and it was like one of those like um um the kind the dishes that he was making was if you came in there and ordered i think he appreciated the way we ordered because like like we were like we want the tongue and the sweet breads and all of this you know kind of kind of stuff and he brought us out some the waiter brought us out some tongue that I swear, whoever was in that kitchen was back there practice, practicing the black arts. It's like I, I <laughs> want to say it. And I was just like, bring that chef to me, which is a thing that I, oh, that I love the way we license each other. Yes. This is a thing he loves about me, and I love that about him, <laughs> is that I was like, bring me that. I said to the, raider, to, to the waiter, bring that chef to me, 
because I have to kiss him because whatever he did to this tongue <laughs> is like, <laughs> like he practiced in some other worldly stuff back there with this tongue and he has to come out here and this chef came out <laughs> to get his kiss. He was quite pleased to <laughs> come out from the kitchen to get his, his kiss, yes. But then this past summer, tongue, we had uh, a tongue is one of the dishes in Ethiopian cuisine. So we went to a, a great uh, Ethiopian restaurant and had uh, the sauteed uh, tongue. And uh, so I, I cook a lot. I cook a lot of Ethiopian food. And so Ray said, when, when, when uh, we go back, I want you to cook this dish, and it's, it, it ha it's never been in my repertoire. So in the fall, I went to the piggery and got some tongue. Uh, now, it's funny, when you eat it, it's so much smaller. <laughs> uh, because, you know, it stretches all the way, just the shape of it, uh, to see it. Um, so, you know, I um, cooked it, and it's, it's a commitment, because it's something that you have to cook at least for five hours, uh, because, Otherwise, it will be chewy uh, and inedible. So with some leeks, some onions, some garlic, uh, some spices, uh, drew up in a broth, cooked it for um, six hours. Uh, and then it comes out, and it's uh, like a sole. You know, it looks like, like a, a foot, actually. And you peel, mm -hmm. you peel the cover, right? That texture that's on, on the tongue, you peel that. And then you have all this... Uh, uh, d you know, a very tender uh, meat, uh, which then, and this is, this is where uh, the, the decadence uh, resides. <laughs> you cut that up and then you saute it slightly in uh, some clarified butter. Uh, and uh, that was uh, one extension of the way in which we're food uh, all the senses, to be present in the world in that sense, right? From one, what tastes, what uh, one does, how one touches. Uh, and, to, and to do that, not just in the privacy of our home, but how to take that into the world. Right, and it uh, like brings me back to that blessing that the, that the priest gave us at Bet Georgi's, where he's taking the dirt, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not... Uh, um, well, I am, like, I was raised Pentecostal, so I am, like, really, really kind of ridiculously religious in some ways that would translate to some people and not to others. But this, this, this notion of taking this dirt out of this sacred space, that that was the thing that he was going to put under our tongues um, to bless us with, and that we would take that dirt of Beck Georgis into our our mouths and the conversations that we've had about Beck Yorgis and about like, how is that thing even made? You know, I remember like kind of walking to campus and we had in that conversation with Joe Cather and he was just like, a lot of people probably lost their lives of how that thing was made. You know, that people were, were you know, um, laboring, you know, to hew that church out of the stone and kind of like the costs of, of things um, being right there, um, present, the life and the, and the death and the, secu the sacred and the secular rubbing right up against each other when you're making things. And to have that always in, present in your mind, to be thinking about that as you're making art, but as you're living your day-to-day -day life, and as a matter of fact, that the making art is the living of your day-to-day -day life. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's funny. One of the kinships where uh, between Ethiopians and African Americans is how the, the way in which the sacred and, and, uh, and the profane or the, the, the secular are so enmeshed that in many ways they're inextricable, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh, uh, it's that's one connection. So in terms of I think about in, in translating your poems, what's been guide to me is one. It's that, right? Uh, repurposing, you know, how how the two 
uh, rub against one another. Um, and then the other is um, a kind of generosity. And maybe this is also the, what the central life uh, uh, demands. And in your poems, I've always found, Ray, that your poems are very complex, but it's not complexity for its own, whatever, intrinsic value, right? Uh, so there's generosity towards the reader, that the reader could come in uh, and inhabit that space. You demand the reader to work, right? But it's not a kind of complexity that is off-putting. Uh, and I found that generosity to be another guide in helping, uh, uh, um, uh, helping me translate uh, uh, these words. This is a thing that comes out of both of the, the past decade of knowing each other, but also having arrived here by happenstance. You know yes. what I'm saying? It's like one of those things, I can't remember not knowing him, but we've only known each other for 10 years. But to, to arrive, here at this place, and then we had like amazing mentors. Like I, when, when you talk about that, I immediately start thinking about Ken McLean. Indeed. About Ken McLean, who's retired from here, who was like our amazing mentor when we got these jobs and were young, you know, uh, back when we were young. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm still young yes, in some yes. ways. <laughs> um, but like back when, you know, when we first got here and generosity was something that Ken like kind of talked about and said to us uh, kind of all of the time. And then it's a thing that like, I feel like is your defining feature as a human being is generosity. And I feel like that's like a blessing to me to be able to pass that on. I've been looking at three of my students here in the front rows in, in this row right here and how many times that I say in class, be generous, be generous in terms of the way that you make the poems and like make openings and entryways for as many people as possible. Be generous, be generous, be generous. But even that is just growing out of, you know, that love and care for each other and the love and care that we received from our mentors, you know, when we were here, which is like kind of amazing where there is, again, it's like there is no separation between how the art, the process of the art being made and that and that, yeah. Let, let me ask you this, how, <laughs> if, if you could, how, how have we licensed each other, Ray? <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, so many ways, each other. One of the things that I'm struck by, even as we're sitting here talking, though, is that when we talk about the sacred and the secular and all of that, and we keep talking about how they rub up against each other, and every time I say rub up against each other, I think about us, mm -hmm. because we're always somewhere dancing to some ratchet music, like as, off, as often as we possibly can, we are somewhere literally rubbing up against e to each other to some, like, ratchet music, and to be, and, and, fully and proudly owning that and not putting that aside as, oh, that's not, that has nothing to do with your academic pursuits or anything like that. Like, no, like you dance and that shit shows up in your work. You know what I'm saying? Like that, <laughs> and that is the way that that is supposed to work, I feel like. Yeah, Absolutely. yes, yes, you know what I do? Um, I, you know, whew, um, to, you know, but, but again, that, that notion, I, this is something I think about, again, I was thinking about it, 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 in anticipation of this conversation, you know, to be self-possessed mm -hmm. in the, in the best way of that idea, right? That, um, that I, you, you have ownership of your body and your desires, and I think that kind of ownership is one way you could bridge the gap between your private and public life that is so, those lives are so divorced for far too many people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think in your company, I'm vigilant to be self-possessed and not to have that chasm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in that chasm where you see hypocrisy. I agree. Uh, you know, uh, but that self-possession of the body entails the ratchet. Uh, 
<laughs> you know, or you know, for some, for some, for some, uh, for some, and um, um, yeah. So there's that, and then I think about to be more courageous in the world, mm -hmm. Ray, uh, because there was an incident in when we were uh, at Oxford University in 2012 or 13, uh, and this was a time, actually, at that very trip. We were sharing. We were in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the same room, hotel room. I woke woke up that day, and all these death threats uh, were being issued. Uh, it was when uh, the thing got put on the inter internet of Is Dagmali Wubshet the first openly gay um, Ethiopian professor, and that had just gotten like kind of all over on the internet. We're sharing a hotel room. Um, I woke up, and here's my best friend, and he's like reading these. Death, death threats, and he is shaken. Like I, I hardly ever see Dag shaken, and he was shaken that morning. I remember before you left ahead of me to go to the to the conference. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. Yeah, and, and and so I met, and, and so I'm giving a, 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 on a panel in the afternoon. Uh, I'm still shaken, and I said something about it, and then uh, in the Q and A, someone gets up and begins to issue more threats and starts to scream at me and Lyra got up. And I thought in that instant, I said, man, you better sit down because she's about to take you out. <laughs> <laughs> you are about to lose a limb <laughs> and I, uh, and th there was, that was the second time in this very building you did the same for me in public once where you stood up and defended me and Friendship is tested in these moments, right? Who, do you have a courageous friend who's going to stand up and protect you, right? Uh, and that to me, uh, your courage in these public ways, but also privately, is something that has truly emboldened uh, me in, 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 this, in these last 10 years. I feel like that license, again, it's like it becomes like a feedback loop for both the work and the friendship because I feel like that comes from you. In that moment, when this nut job is, has nerve enough, that's the way I think about it, to be like, like he knew what had happened in the hotel room this morning. He, he didn't, but I feel like it is, the, it is the job of people to like conduct themselves in such a way that you're not like kind of spreading hate in the world. And he has nerve enough to stand up in this conference and Dag is clearly shaken. He's at the podium and to start to spew hate from that moment. And all I could think in that moment was like, I stood up to get my body between his body and your body. Like, uh-uh, buddy, no way, like no way. But then that other thing that anger, I feel like, is also a, something that comes out in the work and gets put to use. I feel like one of the things that happens with my friendship is you is that put, gets put to use in constructive rather than destructive ways, you know? That anger that I feel like I can make something with that rather than like go, up some, go upside somebody's head, which is what I feel like doing half the time. Southern, like it's in there for me to like just really feel like I'm going to take you out, but also <laughs> instead to be like, I'm going to make, I'm going to make something with that because part of what I want to make is to make my friend proud, you know, and not just be like kind of creating destruction in the, in the world. And by the way, he did, she stood up and said, sit, he sat down grown man <laughs> and then he realized his action and was so shamed by his own inadequacy then he got up again to start again uh, uh. It, it um it, how are we for time uh, maybe one exchange and then we'll open it up i wanted to ask you about tazita because we were talking about Tazita last night and we were listening to casa tesima mm -hmm. last night mm -hmm. and the thing that you said about um owning one's own desires. And you've got this really great essay where you write about Tizita and in the context of starting to think about James Baldwin's late style and like pointing out the way that Tizita, one of the meanings of Tizita is to be longing. And that like kind of 
idea or notion of like kind of living with and in one's own longing mm -hmm. and how that comes through in Tzitzit music and what part, can you find the question? In there? Yeah. Like, what, yeah. Um, you know, I think part of it's, it's by temperament too. Ethiopians are just melancholy people, right? The pursuit of happiness was not part of our, you know, national character. It was not something to aspire to. To be melancholy is, you know, that's a very different orientation. So if melancholy is not mm, policed publicly, then you, 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 you know how to sit with it, uh, to finger it, to... You know what I mean? Uh, and so that sense of to, to be, long, you like the to finger it? I mean, you know, I did. <laughs> uh, to, to be longing in that sense, as a state, longing as a state. And this is actually, a, uh, the, uh, um, you know, because the, the, it, it, it has a song, it's a genre that it, of, of nostalgia. Uh, it's, a, it's like the blues. Uh, it, you know, um, it, it, it's a song of longing, but nostalgia is, is key to it. Uh, but, you know, nostalgia as an idea is, it, it could be reparative, right? You're longing, it's longing and home. That's what uh, the, the word conjoins. Uh, but I, in the Ethiopian iteration of nostalgia, though, uh, it is about longing and not so much about belonging. Right? You are forever longing the, the lover who's gone. And you know clearly that that lover is not going to come back. So, there's no, the, so in that sense, the constellation is in the singing, in the longing, and not in uh, you know, restoration that's, about, that's going to happen uh, uh, in, in the future. Right? Uh, and yeah, but again, in terms of kinship, Ray, it's amazing that for me, uh, why I feel at home in African-American life. Uh, Margie mentioned this, because I use this phrase of how I'm Ethiopian by birth, uh, but I'm African-American by, by choice. choice and by desire, because there are a lot of African immigrants in this country who, for me, for instance, I grew up in an all-black country that had no colonial history. So race was a concept I picked up at age 13 in a real way. <laughs> Right? Uh, so, and, you know, I know Ethiopians who believe themselves to be African and Ethiopian, but the sense of a race, how it functions in America, as a black American, they have a way of disavowing it. For me, it was, oh, I mean, one, it allowed me to be. The capaciousness uh, of blackness you talk about. The capaciousness of blackness. That, yes. The capaciousness of blackness. And we often lose that. I mean, that's... I, and, and, I, and I think about that. I think about that. If I, a 13-year-old foreigner, immigrant, African, now, who had his own, the own, our own ethnic issues or religious issues that ran Ethiopia up, right? But race is just not one of them. And if I could adopt African-American culture and mine it for its riches, it's hard for me to see why Americans, other Americans, particularly white Americans, have yet to be able to do so, right? Because then, or other Africans, in fact, who disavow with black life, because then it's you're seeing that culture always through the filter of the white gaze. Right? But you cannot see it for the riches that it affords. And thank heavens that from the jump, I didn't have that kind of relationship to black culture. Right? Uh, I think about that in terms of thinking about um, that notion of Tizita and to be longing, like to always be longing in terms of the translation project, because it's also that thing of, of inhabiting between spaces, which is a thing that I'm obsessed with in my work, and that's why it's got those gaps and the crazy punctu punctuation and all of that, of being in those between spaces. And to be always longing, I feel like putting the language in, putting the poems in Amharic is to, to enact that always to be longing for that, for my, 
my friend's home and my friend's voice, then it, then it gets down on the page. Is that making sense? Like that, that then to get that notion of to be longing onto the page, that I'll never be like Amharic is a language that I'll always be learning. And I love that I'll always be learning it. I love that. I love that, Ray. Uh, you know, of the, the many things you taught me, one is how in your poetry, to use your phrase, the reach towards the ineffable. Yes. Right? Translation is that. Because you can never reproduce Aksum as it is in English. But translation, if it can reach towards the ineffable, right? Then I think you can make something. You can maybe translate something, um, you know, resonant in the original, in the in 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 the new in the new tongue, uh, and I mean this is the thing. So I've I'm still tinkering with these poems. Part of the difficulty, especially with the new poems, where if you all have read Open Interval or the new work that R L Lyre has been doing, like Migration, is how experimental she is with punctuation and syntax, right? So. I'm still trying to figure out. I feel like finally I have the language. I've, w I've used my ear uh, in many ways to conduct the translation so I get the language right. But in terms of what you do with space on the page, I'm still trying to work that out. And I love, I mean, just how much you've taught me about poetry, Ray. Uh, how, much, how much the relation, now I read a poem, lyric poem, immediately I think again, this is something Lyra students would appreciate. What is the relationship between sentence and line? So immediately I can find my place in a poem. Uh, and another thing why you're, and, and, and Margie so eloquently put, mentioned it too, more recently, because of the punctuation, I think, how you manipulate time and slow down so that each word is its own world, right? And that lends to transla translation in Amharic that such a that has such a rich soundscape, so that you could say a word, and that has its own. It could stand on its own for its own musical composition, in the way in which that I've learned reading and rereading you, but also hearing you read, where ah that attention, right to to word to each word. Open it up. Yes. Do you all have questions, questions that you want to ask? Questions, yeah. Let's open it up. Because we could go on and on and on. <laughs> mm -hmm. With pleasure. Mm -hmm. Axum. I imagine the dead cities beneath the teff. When fields give up their stones, the gift is mine, stand one upright, construct, a shed to protect ancient carved words from rain, and I will fly 8,000 miles to gawk at what I can't read. Children gather, offer up some coins, the fields tender. What do I know about a life of plowing? The donkeys keep their eyes down as I pass. Aksum, itayengal kat efuser, resa katamochu, maskochu, dingai siabra katu sut othau yeneno. Akum katata, ganva matalea, yetent kertz alaten kazanab lemet abbek. Enem mat allo asrasus tishi kilometer berre, fazje lamet nebab. Yetasaningin. The Jo Chuta Sabasabu, Akarabu, Masquiaf around Santimoch. A name in Akadlo, Seller Shanuro, Salfun qua ahiochu, I nachon, deck at deku with a touch. Um, I mean, so it, on the one hand, 
again, just to, I mean, this is the thing about that I'm really appreciating about the translation where you're trusting all your senses, right? So it's not simply you're, you know, governed by a kind of literalism, right? Uh, I mean, in a sense, semantic meaning, but also sonic meaning you're after. So they're all, in that sense, your, your sense is so acute, so it will, it will guide you what to choose. Uh, and then there are certain terms where you also take license, uh, a certain kind of creative uh, license, right? Um, and I would, I would also, I was telling Ray that sometimes you also just, it, it, again, discoveries that so, you know, fortuitous that work in the poem. So um, beneath the first line, beneath the... Uh, I imagine the dead cities beneath the teth. Beneath, uh, is, in Amharic, is sir. Sir, root is also sir. Right? So in Amharic, that line, uh, uh, it's beneath, but also deep in the roots. Right? So, uh, and then maybe that will guide where the next word, how you call the next uh, translation. But again, the ear has been uh, a guide in a way that I didn't anticipate. Corey. Fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> what you trying to do? Why to I love him. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I love him. <laughs> yes, self-possession as a bridge. Yeah. fan frick fantastic. Well, I mean, part of, for me, part of the thing that I was obsessed with in Open Interval was this notion of Lyrae, you know what I'm saying? Am I really that word that is a pulsing variable star and also means of lyric poetry in Latin, but also am I this thing, which is matter and made mostly of space, but also is going to, death, we keep talk, coming back to like kind of this notion of life and death rubbing right up against each other because if I'm just this thing, this thing is gonna decay and be gone, you know? And so like kind of where is the light, where is the, the, the space? And that being the thing that's driving the, the poems that I'm trying to make, makes it so that I have to think about that in terms of the life that I'm trying to live too, because I'm obsessed with identity in so many ways. And I'm just kind of like, who is that? And, and, and trying not to, not to be pretending because it's taxing <laughs> to, to be pretending. You know, I don't want to be pretending for, for anyone, but then also that like kind of takes on the, the all kinds of political connotations because I'm a black woman in America and I'm like obsessively talking about the ways in which that is not supposed to be an identity. That's an identity that the founding fathers disapproved of and wrote about disapproving of. You can't be a black woman poet now. Come on. Like not in America, not in our, you know, notion of what America is. And so always like kind of trying to create that self by being myself is how, how the bridge is working for me, yeah. And I would just add that, you know, punctuation is such an individual gesture, right? And I think about now the M dash, I think, Lyrae. Or the, the thing that Ray does with the bonds of the colon and the two M dashes. That's a signature punctuation. Or that's a punctuation that I cannot confuse with no other person. That's a kind of self-possession. Right? You can give me out of any page just a, a short, maybe two, three sentences of a Baldwin sentence by punctuation alone, by those hyphenated commas. You know that's a James Baldwin line. Right? And I think in that sense, at least on the page, one way that we aim for self-possession may be the way in which we you know, accent our own individual voices. Uh, 
maybe it might be too literal for you, uh, uh, Corey, but that, that's what I would say. Carol had her hand up. Uh, well, the, so a suite of poems, so definitely we're going to include, and that's why, it, I mean, we've only shared two, uh, because when it comes out, we want you to be surprised and, and get the chapbook. <laughs> uh, 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 but so the, the suite of poems, again, that she did on the first trip, uh, and it, it, again uh, on, on this latter trip, uh, so we'll, we'll, definitely, we'll definitely include all of those. Um, and translation as a text... Uh, yeah, Carol, it, it, it's amazing because I've translated from Amharic into English. For instance, in the calendar of loss of the epistles orphans wrote to their deceased parents. And when I first translated uh, the first poem, it takes it, the, the amount of time. I was so excited. The first poem, Aksum, I started it exactly two summers ago. And I, I sent Ray a picture of a draft of it. And just sat with it, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, um, and, but uh, uh, at, at that summer, I was working on a, a, a translation from Amharic, a novella from Amharic into English. What's been wonderful here is just the, the text to see, like it looks, it feels new to me. It, it, it's its own entity because I'm, she has me writing in a language I have not written in, or I don't trade in, right? Even though I speak Amharic, uh, or when I go to Ethiopia, I lecture in it, but I don't write in it. English is the language I write in. So to come back to Amharic and to have this material thing on the page, just that alone feels, I don't know, makes, seeing it in another tongue makes it material. Um, for me, it always feels to me whenever I hear anybody talking about Amharic and the, the little progress that I've made with Amharic is, you know, this idea of wax and gold being in the language, that this is a language that is for poetry. It, like Amharic feels to me like the language I've been longing for. You know, like I've been like, like I had been wanting this language and then didn't know it. And, and, and that it's this, it's a language that comes out of a black, I'm not having to wrestle with it the way that I have to wrestle with English because it's not trying to erase me all the time. And so that is, that has been huge for me too. Oh. statement that really kind of stunned me 
was at the beginning when they said that this is going to be your last lecture. What does that mean? <laughs> It, it just means it's my last lecture, exactly that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just because this is my last uh, uh, semester here at, at Cornell. In it? One last question. A little louder, y'all. I wrote that, I think that's an essay from, I don't know, it's been a while, right? Uh, and maybe this project is, you know, I love that line that Phoebe says uh, 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 to Janie at the end of uh, The Eyes Are Watching God, my, my, was it, my tongue? I'm putting my, yeah, my, my, my tongue is in yeah, your mouth. My tongue mouth. is in your mouth. In your mouth. Right? After she shared the whole story, right, to say, oh, my mouth is in your tongue. And I think maybe I'll have a very different relationship with the English language that because maybe now, you know, she's in my tongue. Vice versa. And I'd like to think, you know, she'll be, right? You'll have that same relationship to Amharic mm -hmm. because, um, yeah, because I'm also in your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, thank you. Thank all. you all for coming out. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Something about a reception. There's a reception. Oh, yeah. There's a reception upstairs, so please join us. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.